that I, I can't be here at all. Um, back in 95, she and I collaborated on a, on a small project in the um, SEM room, and I'll, I'll show you some of the results of that project later on. Dr. Perlman um, is, is mentally impacted in using me to tomorrow back then, so thanks to him. Uh, of course, thanks to Hans, thanks to Neil and everybody for making this possible. Now, um, what uh, I'm going to suggest to you is uh, the, the three things maybe that uh, work very in my here today. Um, and one is the, the cultural position that we find ourselves. It's pretty elementary science that we come to communicate, let's face it. So why is it that everybody knows this stuff and why is it being disseminated widely and why is it already um, at the core of massive research programs and the world over. Well, it's to do with cultural conditioning and, uh, and the power that the um, junk pet food industry, Gap Alliance has. So, um, it'd be nice if you keep that in mind. Oh, there's one. And um, it'd be nice if you keep that in mind for um, the, the coming years because it will forever have an influence on your thoughts and deliberations in this, this area. Um, they're everywhere and, and often um, incognito, so to speak. Otherwise, the immediate clinical and research opportunities are rising out of the fact that uh, a natural diet works wonders, almost minor miracles for our pet carnivores. It's amazing, not only for the, the carnivores, but I suggest um, for all mammals. Because we can learn from those animals and extreme end of the nutritional spectrum. What, what matters to them matters to us in different degrees. And um, arising out of that, I think there's a possibility to get for a new paradigm of health and disease, where really we, we start to um, reconceptualize, reevaluate, and see that death is just the other side of, 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 of the health um, coin, and um, starting to get all of these things into some sort of what I call cyber in context uh, on this planet at the end, uh, 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 the final point in the um, sense of a game, 65 million years, uh, the mammals have been dominating this planet, and uh, it seems to me that uh, this periodontal disease uh, issue has quite a lot to do with um, the way biology is organized all of that. But that's in the rarefied area. Initially I thought, Perhaps just to um, show you a couple of TV programs from back in the early 90s, uh, where you can see for yourself one of these little animals just being resurrected, an animal near death. And let me just mention that I was a bit slow upon the uptake about this myself. It took about 15 years before we finally understood that, whoops, we've been living a lie and we've been poisoning our patients. When we woke up to that fact, well, we had to start apologizing to our clients, begging forgiveness and then uh, turning things around. And in 1993, it's about October, we've spoken to the ABC investigators, um, who those of you who are old enough to know, uh, know that they were a, a consumer affairs uh, investigative sort of program that would look into rorts and, and scams wherever. And they were coming out on the Wednesday. As it happened, Dale Addison came in on the Monday. Now, I'd never met Dale Addison before. She was trying to practice, but there were two or three deaths, and I'd never previously met Dale. But I said to Dale, hey, this is terrific. You probably know a little white dog, 12 years of age, Tess, and she's laying in the leg. Now, of course, I'm going to deal with this matter as soon as I can. I suspect this is a minor matter. But how about the bad skin and the bad ears? What about this mammary tumor? And hey, listen to this, this heart through the stethoscope and I hand over the stethoscope she can hear the heart sloshing around in the chest. She's 12 years of age and look, she's really bony and she's way underweight, isn't she? Hey, how about we open her mouth and have a look? It's set, it's foul, it's in a rotting state. This little dog is rotting alive and has been rotting alive for the best part for 12 years. So Dan Addison's asked me to fix the, the lame leg. But I'm only passingly interested in that. I'm going to go straight into fixing the, the core of the issue here, the rotting mouth, and then fix the diet. And hopefully I'm going to do all this on, on camera on, on a Wednesday before the ABC 
television cameras. This is a bit of an undertaking. And we'll go back and agree to this. We'll happily she does. And that's fantastic. Mind you, I'm on a bit of a hiding for nothing here, aren't I? Because I have foretold that this animal is going to be resurrected and that, that hopefully I'm going to keep it alive long enough for the TV to shoot the film and um, for things to come good at the end. Well, anyway, without more ado, why don't we switch to the, the video? And you can have a look at yourself. See this little white dog? She's embedded in the program. After that, we'll see the Ray Martin show. You'll see the same dog, unrecognizable, five months later. Transformation. And sh I should have mentioned that the core of all this, of course, is that Tess is an immune system that collapsed right through the floor. She'd gotten acquired immune deficiency syndrome as well, so no wonder it began to fall apart. Five months later, you'll see that she gained 20% increase in weight. Her immune system has come back. And do you know how she's done that? She's been fed off chicken wings. I said to, uh, to Dale Axon, do more than chicken wings. I've suggested that as a starting point. Dale's pretty much stuck with chicken wings. So would you believe that we've got this substance that most of us um, think of as a, a, a tasting snack, but no more, that's having incredible medicinal effects. And you'll see that to the point where she's prepared to jump off Ray Martin's lap on the studio floor and start tucking into her chicken wings with no teeth in her upper jaws. Yeah, dramatic stuff. Areas of 
nothing, areas of nothingness. And we didn't know where we were because we'd got no chart and we hadn't been here before, so we were exploring this planet and, and, and we didn't know what it was. But then we happened across this area now. It's only in retrospect that we realized that we were looking at the tooth surface of the calculus. So where the calculus had been adherent to the tooth. Right? And then it had been snapped away. It had come away clearly, cleanly, in this area here. But in that area there, the attachment surface had been removed. And so we were looking right into the core of the calculus. Isn't that amazing? Amazing how it's um, so organized in there. And, and if, you, if you look at it and, and think about it and, and remember your histology of, of liver size, and doesn't it look like um, liver lobules? And couldn't that well be to do with the communication channels um, within that system? This is as far as we got at that point because then I dashed off to do more clinical research and, and, and we ceased it there. But anyway, I'll bring this out now and um, thank you, Mara. But anyway, let, let's get back to the, uh, the, the clinical aspect and, um, and the necessities that we could have picked up on if we were um, a little bit more candid, a bit more acute in our hearing. If we were prepared to listen to the animals instead of just simply talking to them, they got a message for us. These two little dogs know full well just how important that chicken wing is for them. That's why they're tussling over it. They're programmed to do that over millions of years, of course. Their DNA tells them that they've got to do that. And so all the behavioral mechanisms, the physiology, the anatomy all matches up. So that when they see their food and medicine, because that's what that stuff is, then they're going to tussle and fight over it. Winner takes all, because it's a tough world out there. The mother knows how important it is too. Money, you wouldn't be able to stay in the bank with it. 
But this stuff that we're talking about doesn't just fit overweight, underweight. Behavior, this and that, and all those things on the left hand side treats. You can treat these conditions. Now, not always totally 100% successfully, but certainly to the point where you can resurrect dead and dying animals such as you saw in the case of the test. Behavior, you heard Dan Ashton talking about the, the distress of this animal, the barking all night. But of course, other behavioural aspects are that often they, they just sleep under the kitchen table all day. They just feel so wretched every day of their lives. So that when you change their diet, then they perk up and become lively and happy little Vegemites again. Crushed the old cats that used to attack everybody in the past become pussy cats. These are the sort of changes you see. So it's happening at a, at a mental level, at a physiological level, at all that. Of course, uh, you can fix it in your life just some very long time if you saw that. And of course, having extracted the teeth, the first meal you give is a rubbery, tough piece of chicken to toughen up those gums. That's the sort of thing you do when you're in the of the treatment. You saw Tess had vile skin, just, just non-specific, bad skin, dermatitis of an unknown origin. Well, of course, that fixed up as well. And then the arthritis, the, she came in with a, a lane in the leg, strain in the, in the tendon, probably collagen disease, these animals have immense collagen disease in their mouths. The chances are that the arthritis and, uh, and uh, the, the fasciitis and all those inflammations to do with musculoskeletal system are quite likely to do with collagen disease. Fixes men's animals that are stiff and sore and lame suddenly get up and start playing again. Extraordinary stuff. And then, of course, the nephritis and how all those glomerular filtration beds are all clogged up with all the um, the inflammatory uh, products. It's amazing. Again, these animals just resurrect. And drives and so on. Now, once you've fixed your animals on the left hand side, you've done your treatment, then you flip all those things over onto the right hand side and they add to the prevention list. Those are the things that you can prevent as well once once you fix them. But of course it's the lucky animals that never ever had the junk food in the first place, never had ever had the periodontitis in the first place then they have all of those things prevented right under the starting gate. And that's, of course, really what our goal and aim should be. As clinicians, I'm a veterinary clinician, you're dental clinicians, and some of you might be medical clinicians, surely that's what we should be about. It's just preventing ill health in the first place. And we can do that. Why, why are fleas prevented? Well, you know, you can speculate. And these are some sort of things that we need to know. We need to start to investigate why. Is it that fleas don't like an animal with a strong immune system? Or is it that the strong immune system repels the fleas? Or is it a combination of both? And of course, that's oftentimes what we find. It's, it's, it's a two-fold, two-way process. So, with the eye on the clock, um, it gives some thought to where this might go in medical and dental research. Well, it might go everywhere because, of course, we can learn so much from our uh, carnivore regulators in this age of mammals. What regulates them, in all probability, to some degree, regulates us. But in any event, they present a wonderful experimental model because you can just simply get a few pens of dogs and cats and ferrets and, and, and uh, feed them according to your whim and do all sorts of tests and investigations and come up with all sorts of information I, I suggest to you are highly applicable to the um, human, the human and medical situation. The kind of the extreme end of the nutritional spectrum has very refined, specified needs, and, and therefore you don't have all that background noise that you have when you're dealing with the omnivore. And of course, obviously, as I've said, um, you can experiment on these animals because they don't, don't, don't complain, fortunately. It's just interesting uh, that I've got their kind of illustration on it. And so many people now worldwide, and uh, whilst it may be obscure here, and you perhaps haven't heard of this before, but worldwide there's quite a movement now of people who are now feeding their own animals on a more natural diet. And uh, I gave a series of lectures in England in 2002, I think it was, and my host there, prior to my arrival, I said, oh yes, look, um, husband and wife, they used to meet each other on the stairs, they had this wonderful old farmhouse, and then one would be going up to the bathroom as the other was coming down, and they're busily flossing their teeth. And, and it's not just people who are really into this, it's just ordinary pet owners who start
start to realize, gee, I didn't realize uh, the, the health implications of toothbrush and flossing. So it's an incredibly good uh, public health uh, and, and, and community awareness aim. Immune system research, well, you saw with, with the test there. Have a look at Romney um, Bones chapter 7. And, and I suggest that there's lots of information to be had there. What about the natural diet for research animals? Well, oh, here's an interesting one. Okay, well, look, all those research animals out there, the carnivores that are used in, in all manner of different research, for the most part, fed on junk food, so they've got background information, haven't they? They're sick. So no wonder you've got randomised, random results that are hard to interpret. I met a man at the airport who said, oh, you'll be doing um, information research. Well, that's a euphemism for saying, okay, well, we take a bunch of dogs and we burn them with a blowtorch and then we give them these um, anti so-called anti-inflammatories and just see what it does. I said, well, yeah, but there's a whole lot of background information in your, uh, your, your uh, subject test animals. Um, so, really, you know, your results are a bit um, random, aren't they? Oh, yeah, we'll get over that by just getting a um, bigger batch of animals to, to overcome the statistical variation. Which is crazy, isn't it? It's just crazy. So, apart from being cruel. And, and human mental health, okay. Um, John has written about this. Uh, There's a big move these days to suggest to you that um, everybody's got to get a pet, preferably get two, um, in order to improve your state of health and, and well-being and so on. That's a big propaganda push on the part of the vets and the junk pet food industry. Don't have a bar of it. The opposite has been shown to be the case. John et al. Um, and uh, German gerontology, just to a good one, you can find that okay. Dog bites, okay, these animals are out of their tree, they're very angry, upset. Um, how many kids are disfigured and maimed as a result of dogs being fed on junk food? Sadly, though, of course, um, the junk pet food industry then infiltrates the bites and dog bites and kids program here at the Children's Hospital. So everyone's dumbed down and everybody's just uh, suitably anesthetized and doesn't worry too much. What about the poor kids, I asked. Working dogs, that's a good one. And how about this? So, okay, so they've got the working dogs um, detecting um, estrus, and I believe that these days they're trying to use dogs for detecting cancer as well. The estrus detection dogs, uh, detecting estrus in milking cows, were working very well. Took them away, cleaned their teeth, and within 24 hours their sense of smell came back. What does that tell you? Amazing stuff. Where does the, the um, bone marrow nasal organ fit into this? That could be a silent explanation as to what that organ's for after all, after all these years and we haven't really known. And then, well, the potential new paradigm of health and disease. Well, I forget this is the interesting bit. Thank you. And, uh, and, and it, basically the, the introductory aspect of that is, uh, is, is in a cybernetic hypothesis of, of uh, periodontal disease in mammalian carnivores that each of you has there, and it's covered in more detail in chapter 14 of more many bones. And by the way, you don't have to apply this book if, if you can read it on, on the internet. Just go to www.moremanybones.com and it's there to be read on, online. Um, yes, they're the supreme controllers. And of course, they in turn are controlled by a supply of raw meat bones. And if they get a bit over hungry, a bit over keen, and they go in a bit too hard, and then they get kicked in the mouth, and then they get a fractured canine teeth, tooth um, with a root canal that travels right up into the crown of the tooth, then they've then got an endodontic lesion, haven't they? So, can you see the knife edge that these um, carnivores live on? This is critical, I suggest, to their biology, and in some way, it's critical to the rest of us. The, the supreme regulators regulate the herbivores, which in turn regulate the herbs, which regulate the environment and the rainfall and the river flow and so on. So there's an incredible uh, matrix of, of interconnectivity. But, but, alas, we're not allowed to talk about it. We're banned. This is the vicious harmful conspiracy theory nonsense, they say. And you shall not talk about this ever again, as of 1993. On the slide there, you'll see 
three clips from the March 1993 Australian Veterinary Association news. They had barely tolerated us writing about this in the letters pages for 18 months. We tumbled across this amazing set of understandings which resurrected dead and near dead animals and kept young puppies and kittens healthy for the rest of their lives. And we were banned from talking about it. We were not allowed to talk about diet, affecting all of our patients, periodontal disease affecting 85% plus of our patients. The middle section, periodontal disease indicated in many conditions, was the uh, title, misspelled, of, of a letter submitted by Jason Pollard. I wrote it, but I got to the point where they wouldn't even allow me to, under my own name, to write letters in. So I wrote the letter, sent it in, got it published. But then they put at the bottom, you will not talk about this ever again. And that's the reality, folks. In the veterinary profession, this is a taboo subject. Not allowed to talk about that. Not allowed to talk about where that comes from. Not allowed to talk about what to do about it. Not allowed to talk about all the different aspects, the impact on animal health, human health, human economy, and the wider environment. Not allowed to talk about that, how wonderful it is, and the lessons that can be learned. So, we got under the radar here today. Mara helped in that regard, and I'm very much grateful to her. Grateful to you for coming. Leave you with one last slide. Thanks a lot. Although even on a more natural diet, dogs will eat. Uh, it's a dog, you said, with a 
Yes, yeah. Um, will they grass? And they seem to eat two sorts of grass. One is the long fibrous grass, and the other is, it, is the, the, the small, rather more delicate grass. We don't exactly know why dogs eat grass, but it's postulated maybe it's the, the chlorophyll that acts as some sort of anti, um, anti um, septic in, in the mouth. Um, it could be that they can't promote vomiting and bring up gastric acids, which again could be an antiseptic. Who knows? We, it's a lot we don't know. Um, but what we do know, of course, is that the, the, the kibble, the, the uh, dry food, the grain based, or doom nuggets are harmful. So, you know, let's focus on that and, and fix that. That's really important. Just one question for me, John. Yes. Uh, we are aware of the fact that uh, in the years when my scurvy was one of the big causes of tumors and as a result of the Polish disease uh, in, in North America, so only, only eating dried meat out from the oceans. Um, if, if, if an animal is subjected to only the, uh, you know, the, the, the meat, we are going to make a little sea something in the problem. But they make their own. Carnivores make their own vitamin C. So, so in the liver, as far as I'm aware. Have yeah. you done any studies on the, the ethanol difference between a healthy diet and the um, medical? Good question, thank you for that. Economic studies. Yeah, well, look, a lot of this is anecdotal because at the beginning, at the forefront of any sort of new wave of discovery, then all you've got to go on is your eyes, your ears, and an initial sense of what's going on. And um, so this is anecdotal, but I'll tell you that the price of uh, uh, food comes down to about a third. That's a, broadly speaking uh, the case here in, in Australia. And then the, um, the bed doors come down to virtually nothing. And, and there is indeed some work. The canine health um, concern in the UK did some, some work. It, you know, it, you'd have to say that it's not exactly um, statistically sound or, or, or wonderfully case controlled, but nonetheless it demonstrates that you, you, your vet bills virtually disappear. I know that for a fact, running my practice, that I destroyed my client base. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> very rapidly destroyed my client base by telling this story. Because somebody would come in with, for instance, Tess Asson, the, the little white dog, I'd come in with laying in the leg and, I, and I, I'd fix that. Did I need to see that little dog ever again? But she never, no. She fixed, mended, the immune system was back to normal, everything was in, in order, she was getting the right fuel for her needs, you know, she, on a daily basis, and was propped up. Did Tess Asson's um, owners have, have neighbours and friends and relations, you bet they did. Did they die now on this story? For sure. So all those animals, all those people with, it, with younger animals, kittens, puppies and whatever, will start to make the change. Maybe not completely, but they will start to introduce a more natural element of the diet. Some did it 100%. Their needs for the vet virtually became nil. The other folks who were repelled because they saw their animals being furry toys and adjunct to their modern consumer lifestyle would be repelled by this concept that actually you're dealing with a carnivore here, you're dealing with a modified wolf or, or a barely modified cat, um, and, and would take their custom elsewhere. So that was, that was another aspect. But overall, most definitely, this has huge economic ramifications, massive. Yes, it's amazing for me to thank Tom very much for to us and to um, re-educate many of us who are off their owners. Um, coming from Africa, the pride of lions certainly work as a team, and I've seen it on many instances in the land parks in Africa. Uh, and if they don't work as a team, they're certainly not going to have their, their meaty bones. And uh, obviously, it um, falls upon us as pet owners to, to fulfill that team approach uh, as we are as dentists. Uh, if our animals don't have us as the, the 